This Sunday, arrested development. Donald Trump is arrested for the fourth time and becomes the first president to have his mugshot taken. His 18 co-defendants, including his former chief of staff, also surrendered after being charged for their efforts to overturn the 2020 Georgia election results. What has taken place here is a travesty of justice. And at the party's first debate, Trump's rivals promised to support him, even if he's a convicted felon. Would you still support him as your party's choice? As Trump navigates his legal challenges, will any of his political challengers find a path to beat him? Plus, stealing the spotlight, he grabbed all the attention in the first Republican primary debate. If you have a broken car, you don't turn over the keys to the people who broke it again. You hand it over to a new generation to actually fix the problem. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like ChatGPT standing up here. Vivek Ramaswamy, the millennial entrepreneur who has never held political office, is facing intense scrutiny over his views. You have no foreign policy experience, and it shows. And you know what? I'll talk to the political outsider who clashed the most with his GOP rival. And 2024 vision. Senator Bernie Sanders issues a warning to Democrats about how to win the future. There has got to be an ideological change of course. I'll ask President Biden's chief rival from 2020 what he wants to see the Democrats focus on for a second Biden term. Joining me for insight and analysis are former Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy of Florida, former Republican Governor of North Carolina, Pat McCrory, Danielle Pletka of the American Enterprise Institute, and Marcos Melitzis, the founder of Daily Coast. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. Donald Trump's inevitability, the idea that he cannot be beaten in this Republican primary, has been a source of strength for him. At Wednesday night's debate, we saw what a campaign, though, could look like on Earth, too, without Trump on stage. But we still live on this version of Earth, and until one of Trump's opponents is recognized as a viable challenge by Republican primary voters, it is a debate that may have to be put on hold until 2027. That said, a failure of imagination turned the idea that Trump could never win in 2016 into faulty conventional wisdom. And it's that same failure of imagination now to believe that he can't lose the Republican primary that we should be cautious of. The main threat to Trump has always been his legal troubles. And his campaign may be cashing in on the mugshot released after his booking on Thursday night right now. But it is a visual representation of the four indictments and 91 felony counts against him and the political trouble they may represent, thanks to a whole bunch of unknown unknowns with the legal calendar. Currently, all 18 of Trump's co-defendants have now turned themselves in in the Georgia racketeering case. Two have already requested a speedy trial, leading to questions about whether they might cooperate. Kenneth Cheeseborough, he's the lawyer who wrote the campaign memo that essentially was used and laid out the plot to use false slates of electors to subvert the 2020 election. And Sidney Powell wants a speedy trial. She's the lawyer who allegedly accessed and removed voter data in a county in Georgia, as well as filing numerous unsuccessful lawsuits on Trump's behalf alleging fraud. John Eastman, another lawyer who helped develop the plan to use slates of false electors to keep Trump in office, is also likely to request a speedy trial as well. So consider a televised trial, Georgia law, of these defendants starting as early as this October and potentially before any trial that features Donald Trump starts? And Fannie Willis could lay out the case against Trump for the nation ahead of the start of the primary calendar. That's an unknown unknown that I'm pointing out here. Some of Trump's Republican opponents tiptoeing towards pointing out that a campaign year full of courtroom motions and trials might not be the greatest general election politics for the GOP. We have to face the fact that Trump is the most disliked politician in America. We can't win a general election that way. And yet, at least six of the eight Republicans on stage in Milwaukee, including Haley, raised their hands to confirm that they would support Trump in 2024, even if he is convicted by a jury of his peers. And they made the odd decision to pile on political newcomer Vivek Ramaswamy, who may be surging, but is still barely cracking double digits. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. We don't need to bring in a rookie. We don't need to bring in people without experience. I 
I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like chat GPT standing up here. There you have it. You're watching. So you the reality make America is America less safe. You have no foreign me, policy experience and it shows. And you know what? The arrows may have come because Rama Swamily took every opportunity on stage to defend and praise the man who wasn't there, Donald Trump. President Trump, I believe, was the best president of the 21st century. It's a fact. And joining me now is the Republican presidential candidate that was at the center of the debate, Vivek Ramaswamy. Mr. Ramaswamy, welcome back to Meet the Press. It's good to talk to you, Chad. Uh, let me start with the tragedy uh, that took place in Jacksonville. Um, this is what uh, Sheriff Waters, how he described uh, the incident last night. This shooting was racially motivated, and he hated black people. He wanted to kill he targeted a certain group of people, and that's black people. That's what he, that's what he said he wanted to kill. And um, that's very clear. And uh, I don't know that the targets were specific, but I know that any member of that, of that race at that time was in danger. Both the FBI and DHS in the last two years have said that racially motivated violent extremism is on the rise. This is clearly part of that. What would a President Ramaswamy want the Justice Department to do about this racially motivated violence that we're seeing on the rise? I think that every criminal deserves to be punished to the fullest extent of the law, especially when they're carrying out premeditated crimes like this one. This is a heinous crime. My heart goes out to the families who were affected by this. It is tragic, and this should not be happening in the United States of America. I think the fact of the matter is, Chuck, it is really just a symptom of a deeper new form of national division that we have created. And I think one of my top jobs as the next U.S. president is really to lead with a national tone of character that reminds us of how we are all united across our diverse attributes. I think part of the problem is we have obsessed so much mm. over racial and other genetic differences that we have forgotten all of the ways we're really the same as a country. And I do think we need a leader and in the White House developing that national character for this country again. We also do have a mental health epidemic across this country, Chuck, that really is reflective of a hunger for purpose yeah. and meaning. What? We need to fill that void, address the mental health epidemic, but this is a tragedy and deserves to be called out as heinous. That's exactly what it was. Why do you think there are more race-based uh, violent crimes on the right than on the left? Why is this a little more pervasive, a lot more pervasive on the right? Well, the fact of the matter is I think that there's a lot more violence that's also pervasive in parts of the country that supposedly are left-wing voter bases. So I don't think this is a left versus right issue, and I don't think we should try to politicize this through partisan goggles either, Chuck, especially in the wake of a tragedy like this one. The fact is there are ignore more the black manifesto? men dying on the south side of Chicago. Do you ignore the elements that, that? allowed this manifesto to, to spread online and that what we're, you know... It does feel as if social media well, the f connects some of these hate hateful ideologies. Well, the fact of the matter is I do think we have two standards that we're even applying if we're having a conversation about manifestos. We still have not yet even seen the manifesto of that transgender shooter in Nashville of a Christian school, and yet here we're focusing on the motive. So if we want to look at this through a politicized lens, let's look at what the political media and the political establishment is doing differentially in how they analyze different crimes and then create a new narrative around it. The fact is, what I said in the Nashville shooter case, I will say here, any killing, any mass killing is heinous. We need to get to the root cause of the mental health epidemic, address that. We need leadership that sets the right tone in this country. But if we are going to talk about manifestos and politicization, Chuck, I think it is incomplete not to look at the absence of releasing that Nashville shooter manifesto even as of today. That's why I personally traveled to Nashville to call for it. And that, I think, is the best evidence of real politicization in terms of what the public sees and what the public doesn't. I want to apply one I, standard I, for everybody. I, I don't okay. want to look at this through partisan goggles. I want to look at this through one standard of the right. rule of law for everybody. You believe racism is a mental health issue? Well, I do believe that racism in many cases is manufactured in a way that creates more racism in this country. I cannot think of a greater way, Chuck, of driving racism in this country than to take something else away from someone based on the color of their skin. And so is there existing racism in the United States? Of course there is. 
But those last burning embers of racism, the last thing I want to do is throw kerosene on it. And yet that's exactly what I believe the modern culture is doing by creating race-based quota systems that deny people access to goods or services based on the color of their skin. The right answer to stop discrimination on the basis of race, as John Roberts said it, is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And I am genuinely worried that we're seeing a new wave of anti-black and anti-Hispanic racism just so you, just as so a you know, consequence your of the so-called anti-racist across, movements. Your argument comes across as blaming those that are trying to create equality for the rise in racism. Well, the fact is, Chuck, I don't want to be playing a blame game. I want to be going towards a solution. And I am genuinely worried that those who earnestly espouse the view, I'm going to quote Ibram Kendi from his book directly, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth, says the right answer to past discrimination is present discrimination. The right answer to present discrimination is future discrimination. I believe the people who hold that view are earnest about it, but I think they're wrong. And I think that that's actually creating more discrimination and more division in our country. And I think the right answer is actually to restore colorblind equality, colorblind meritocracy, embrace what unites us across our diversity instead of celebrating our skin deep diverse attributes. That's how I think we reunite this country, Chuck. And it's not blaming anybody else for having a different point of view. But I do think that as a leader, it's my job to articulate exactly how we will unite this country. And that's exactly how I'm going to do it. Let me move to the debate. And uh, a lot of people are asking this question. If you believe Donald Trump is the greatest president of the 21st century, he's running. Why are you running against him? Why do you think his second term won't be as good as his first? Well, look, I did say he's the best president of the 21st century. From George Bush to Barack Obama to Joe Biden to Donald Trump, I think it's not even close. Who was the best of those presidents? In my book, I judge by results. That being said, I believe I can take the America First agenda even further than Donald Trump did. I think I will be more effective in uniting this country in the process. Look at the way we're running this campaign. I'm not leaving any state behind, any city behind, no American left behind. From the south side of Chicago to Kensington, to places where traditional Republicans don't go. I think I am best positioned to deliver a landslide election, a multi-ethnic, working-class majority. And I do think that a landslide is what we need in this country, not another 50.1 election. And I'm the only candidate in this race who can actually deliver that. Look, a political neophyte outsider became president and couldn't get a lot of the things done that he wanted to get done in Donald Trump. Why do you think somebody with uh, less experience than Donald Trump had is somehow going to make the federal government uh, uh, function in a way that you're outlining. So I think there's three things I would say. The first is we have that experience to learn from. I want to build on the foundation that Trump laid. Frankly, I will invite him as an advisor and a mentor. I don't want to relearn the same lessons. I want to pick up where he left off in taking on the administrative state. The second thing, Chuck, is I do think it needs to be an outsider to take on that administrative state. But I also think it needs to be an outsider who has a deep first personal understanding of the laws and constitution of this country. I think Trump was in many cases duped by his managerial advisors, for example, who said that you can't fire employees in the federal government due to civil service protections. Read the law. Turns out those civil service protections only apply to individual firings, not to mass layoffs. Mass layoffs are absolutely what I will bring to the D.C. bureaucracy. And I think the fact that I am from a different generation, Chuck, will be an asset. I'm able to reach young Americans. I'm able to reach people who haven't traditionally been brought into the mold of Republican politics. I don't even talk about Republicans and Democrats. And so I think I'll be able to build a greater moral mandate across generations that helps unite Americans around the America First agenda rather than making it a strictly partisan affair. Uh, Let me bring up a couple questions you didn't get a chance to answer at the debate. Most of the candidates on stage Wednesday night said Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th. Do you agree? I would have done it very differently. I think that there was a historic opportunity that he missed to reunite this country in that window. What I would have said is this is a moment for a true national consensus where there's two elements of what's required for a functioning democracy in America. One is secure elections, and the second is a peaceful transfer of power. When those things come into conflict, that's an opportunity for heroism. Here's what I would have said. We need single-day voting on Election Day. We need paper ballots, and we need government-issued ID matching the voter file. And if we achieve that, 
then we have achieved victory, and we should not have any further complaint about election integrity. So what would, so what I would, would have you driven have done? it through the Senate. So what would you have done as, with Mike Pence? You would have so not my capacity, certified the election? So in, in my capacity as president of the Senate, I would have led through that level of reform, then on that condition certified the election results, served it up to the president, yeah. President Trump then to sign that into law, and on January 7th declared the re-election campaign pursuant to a free and fair election. I think that was a missed opportunity, but that's the kind right. of spirit we're going to need to unite this country rather right. than sweeping those concerns under the rug. Eleven months ago, well, excuse me, in what, no, excuse me, uh, in your book, which wasn't written that long ago, um, you wrote the fact that all of our governmental institutions so unanimously found no evidence of significant fraud is telling. Furthermore, I've talked to many Republicans at all levels of government, and not one has ever presented convincing evidence that the 2020 election was stolen from President Trump. Very few have seriously tried. I don't believe that most Republican politicians actually think the election was stolen. So you went from there, so let, let me address and this. 11 months later, your views have changed on January 6th? Again, this book was written September yeah, of 2022. Chuck, I'm happy to address that if, you, if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah, so and read exactly that chapter in the book. I drew a sharp distinction between what I did see as the interference in the election that mattered, which was interference by big tech. I'm data-driven. There's hard data showing that many voters, many independent voters, would have changed their result enough to influence the outcome of the election yeah. if they had been exposed to what we now know to be the truth about the Hunter Biden laptop story. By contrast, I've also been clear. I have not yet seen evidence that there was ballot fraud of a scale that would have changed that result. I'm just responding to data on both fronts. But the fact of the matter is, if we're looking at reuniting this country, there are serious concerns on both sides, but especially on the right, about the concern of elections and election interference and ballot fraud, but also big tech interference. Yeah. And there's a very clear result and way we can address that. I've offered a clear consensus that everybody can get behind. It is practical. And if people really think that debating this issue is a threat to our democracy, that should be an easy consensus to be able to rally around. And that's how I'll lead as president. First of all, you never talked about the tech stuff in your book. This is a new thing. It Actually, is not, that's false, Chuck. It, it's it, in the it, same, you have not Chuck, talked about this Hunter false. Biden a nation of victims. A, a, aspect, aspect of it. We were looking Chuck, for I, it. Chuck, I think you have not. I think you have not read nation. I think you have not read Nation of Victims. Literally read the book. There is about twenty pages of content devoted yeah, to this, and I also bring it up. You didn't write about election so fraud that it, way. It, it's fine, but you, you don't but have an obligation to read my book. But, I, but if you, you do, because quote you it said, correctly. We, well, we have been, and let me quote it again. We used. You're referring to Republicans. We use stolen election theories as a backdoor to embracing our own victim identity uh, path, pursuing an easy path to power. It, throughout this entire book, you mock the entire January 6th aspect. You, you absolutely criticize Donald Trump for being a sore loser. You write about it in a way of making your point that you've be, we've become a nation of victims. And right now on TV, you're doing the exact opposite. I'm not. Chuck, I actually want to be very clear. I preached to conservative audiences last... I was in Iowa over the last two days, and what do I tell them? We're not going to be victims. We're going to be victorious. Whether I'm talking to the left or the right, I say the same thing. I've also been very clear, Chuck, and I want to be clear today, that I would have made very different judgments than Donald Trump did that day and on many of the matters in his path out of office. But there's a difference between a bad judgment and a crime. And what I've been clear about is when we criminalize those bad judgments... That's an abuse of the justice system. It undermines trust not only in our elections but in our justice system. We have to be able to draw those distinctions. And I do think, Chuck, it's going to take that kind of leader who can actually yeah. preach truth to both tribes in this country to reunite this country. So did Donald Trump make all the right judgments? No, I said so then, I say so now. Was that illegal and should we criminalize it? Absolutely not. But I want to lead this nation forward. That is my goal, not to look in the rearview mirror. And in order to do that, I think on the election integrity issue, we have an opportunity to put this de debate behind us by single day voting on election day as a national holiday with paper ballots and government issued ID. This should not be controversial. And if that helps reunite this country yeah. as I believe it will, that's exactly how I must lead as president. And that's my commitment. All right. Again, from your book, no one likes a sore loser. That's one of the worst victim hurt complexes of all. Are you referring to Donald Trump? I referred in that chapter both to Stacey Abrams and to Donald Trump. And I think that the answer is we need leaders who ultimately stand for victory over victimhood. We did have a victimhood culture that started on the left in this country, the oppression hierarchy. 
My worry, Chuck, is that that can spread to the right. And the way that this so-called culture war will end is not with a bang, but with a whimper where each side imitates the methods of the other. That related even to some of my our earlier conversation on seeing each other based on the color of our skin. I think that is deeply divisive. What we need in this country is to revive the shared ideals that unite all of us as Americans. The pursuit of excellence, meritocracy, free speech, the rule of law. I genuinely believe, Chuck, that most Americans, regardless of black or white, red or blue, share these ideals in common. And that's what I'm reviving. I I understand that. But again, let me let me go back to quoting you. The Republican Party seems to be moving towards the position that any races it wins are legitimate and any it loses were stolen. It's just the preferred preferred conservative brand of victimhood, a knee jerk kind of sore losing more common to playground than great republics. You seem to, at the time you wrote your book, believe this was potentially damaging to the rule of law. This was not a way to uh, have a democracy uh, thrive. And you're now speaking in a way that gives essentially a permission slip to election deniers to believe there's some truth to something that you yourself have yet to find evidence of. Chuck, I stand by everything I said. That was a book where 11 of the 12 chapters were dedicated to a lot of left-wing victimhood in this country, but it would have been incomplete for me not to call out my own tribe. And my point is, I don't want to see this in terms of red versus blue. We've created an incentive structure in this country, whoever you are, whatever your skin color, increasingly whatever your political affiliation, to see yourself as a victim. I refuse to see myself as a victim. Hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. We are going through hardship as a country right now, including many conservatives. Hardship is sometimes not a choice. Victimhood is a choice. And so whoever the American is that I'm talking to, I say we do not choose victimhood. We choose victory. That is who we are. And I think we can be stronger on the other side of it. So, Chuck, this isn't some game of gotcha. I stand by everything I've written over the last three years in the books that I have, except for a few areas on facts where, as the new facts have come up, I've changed my mind. But in the core theses, I'm in the exact place I am as when I wrote those books. But the point of the matter is, I'm not in this race to lead a political party. I am in this race to lead a nation. I'm using the Republican Party as a vehicle to advance an America First agenda that I think many All Americans, right. most I, Americans one thing can I want to clear up. behind. That's what we're going to need. One thing I want to clear up. I know you've only voted in two presidential elections. Um, where did yeah. you vote in 2020? And how did you vote? I voted in Ohio. And during the coronavirus pandemic, I voted by mail. That's, you voted. that's exactly vote. how I voted. And you know, and the fact of the matter is, The fact of the matter is, I think we should have one standard for everybody. But for me, for much of my 20s, I was disaffected from politics. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, I understand why young people are disaffected. I was uninspired by John Kerry and George Bush. I voted Libertarian that year. Or by John McCain and Barack Obama. Or Mitt Romney Mm -hmm. or Barack Obama. So I don't make any bones about that. I actually talk about it in my speeches. And you're also also uninspired by Donald Trump in 2016. Right? I was skeptical of Donald. I was skeptical of Donald Trump in 2016. That is accurate because I had grown up in a generation where I felt like we had been lied to from weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to the 2008 financial bailouts. Those are Republican examples to Democrat examples of the Russia collusion hoax. So I was deeply skeptical, but I judged based on results and I voted for him with confidence in 2020. Vivek Ramaswamy, like I said, you became the center of the debate. We will be following your campaign as it goes on. Be safe on the trail, and thanks for coming on and sharing your views. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. When we come back, what is the Biden second-term agenda? Senator Bernie Sanders, President Biden's chief rival in 2020, joins me next with his thoughts on what issues he wants Democrats to be running on. Welcome back. Back in April, Senator Bernie Sanders, who, of course, was Biden's chief rival in the 2020 Democratic primaries, ruled out a third presidential bid and endorsed Biden for re-election. But on Saturday, Sanders was back in New Hampshire, one of those early presidential states where he won both the 2016 and 2020 primaries to share what he called his concrete agenda for the future of the Democratic Party at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Of course, when you go to New Hampshire, it sparks some speculation about his own political future. It is no secret that I want Joe Biden to be reelected president. If that is going to happen, If we are going to defeat creeping authoritarianism and right-wing extremism, there has got to be an ideological change, of course. 
The independent senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, joins me now. Senator Sanders, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thank you for having me. So, the fact that you felt the need to do this, should we read into the fact that you don't believe there's a second-term agenda yet that uh, Americans can wrap their head around for what a second Biden term would look like? No. I think what you can read into that is that Biden has every right to be proud of a long series of accomplishments. You know, two and a half, three years ago, this country was in the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression because of COVID. Today, unemployment is all of 3%. We're gaining new jobs, rebuilding manufacturing. We've invested in the uh, infrastructure. infrastructure. Uh, we're making progress, and Biden has a right to be proud of that. The point of my remarks is that you cannot simply, as President of the United States, rest on your laurels. What you have got to understand is that today, for structural reasons that have gone on for decades, tens and tens of millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. They can't afford health care. They can't afford prescription drugs. They can't afford housing. Yeah. They can't afford child care. And meanwhile, in the midst of all of that, you have incredible corporate greed, and the billionaire class has never done better. So my message yesterday for the Democrats, not just for the president, yeah. is if you want to do well in this election, talk to the needs of the American people, have the guts to take on the big money and trust who have so much power. It sounds like you don't think the phrase, finish the job, is something to rally around, that there needs to be more than that. It's, yes, you need to recognize that not only have we accomplished a great deal in Biden's first three years, and he deserves credit for that, but there are so many long-term problems that this country is facing. Does anybody in America think that our health care system is working? Yeah. And yet the insurance companies make tens of billions of dollars, drug companies make tens of billions of dollars. We don't have enough doctors, nurses, mental health providers, pharmacists, dentists. So we need fundamental reform in health care. And by the way, the existential issue of our time is whether or not we address yeah. climate change. And we have made some steps forward. But there is no question in my mind if we're going to provide, a pla allow our kids and grandchildren yeah. to live in a healthy planet, we've got a lot, lot more to do. Do you think there would be a robust discussion on this on the left if there were a competitive primary? Do you think there should be? Well, what I have, I think in this particular time, this particular moment in American history, when we're taking on uh, somebody, the former president, who in fact does not believe in democracy, he's an authoritarian uh, and a very, very dangerous person. I think at this moment, there has got to be a unification mm -hmm. of progressive people in general all over this country, people who are prepared to make sure that women control their own body, that we deal with climate change, that we represent the needs of the working class of this country and take on the billionaire class. Uh, one way that you make it clear that age isn't a factor with you is you're pretty energetic. We see you travel the country. You show up on, <laughs> you do interviews. Um, what do you, it is clearly an issue for many voters when it comes to President Biden. He's a year younger than you. You have advice to him on how he should uh, assuage those uh, concerns in the public about his age? Look, when people look at a candidate, whether it's Joe Biden or Trump or Bernie Sanders, anybody else, you know, they have to evaluate a whole lot of factors. Uh, I, you know, met with the president, I don't know, five or six weeks ago. We had a great discussion. He seemed fine to me. But I think at the end of the day, what we have got to ask ourselves is what do people stand for? Do you believe the women have a right to control their own bodies. Well, the president has been strong on that. Do you think that climate change is real? Or do you agree with the Republicans that it's a non-issue? Do you think we should raise the minimum wage? Do you think we should reform and to take on the pharmaceutical industry? So age is an issue, Chuck, but there are a lot of broader issues than just that. Um, let me ask you about Cornell West. He was a co-chair of your campaign in 2020. He's flirting with a <laughs> Green Party bid for president. Um, the numbers tell the story between 2016 and 2020. Um, you can directly correlate the two third party major candidates, third party candidates, their collective total. Um, that was the difference between Biden winning states and Clinton losing those key states. Uh, are you trying to discourage Cornell West from running? Well, I've known Cornell for many, many years. He's a very independent 
mind the guy, he will do what he wants to do. Uh, I just think, again, uh, I think Cornell or anybody else can play an important role now about raising uh, issues that are not always discussed. But at the end of the day, I think the progressive community in general and the American people yeah. have got to make a decision as to whether we stand for democracy or authoritarianism or whether or not we're going to yeah. represent working class families. One, and, one of your yeah, chief political I advisors am, yeah, is concerned that Cornell West is being taken advantage of by maybe people that simply want his name on the ballot. Do you have those concerns? I really haven't followed it that closely. All right. Bernie Sanders, uh, the independent senator from Vermont, who we saw in New Hampshire yesterday. Thanks for coming on and sharing your views with us. Good to see you. Thank you. When we come Thank back, you. the Republican presidential hopefuls tried to make the case for why they are the best alternative to Donald Trump. But do Republican voters really want an alternative? Panel is next. Welcome back. Panel is here. Former Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy of Florida. Marcos Melitzis the founder of The Daily Coats, former Republican Governor Pat McCrory of North Carolina, and Danielle Pletka, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Well, let me start with the visual that I think uh, will live uh, for quite some time, and that is the show of hands on Donald Trump. Let's play it again. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Danny Pletka, it was a moment, especially it like cascaded like a wave. And it was sort of like the most enthusiastic was Vivek. That's not surprising. And then everybody yeah. else. It was this reluctance. That well, was there was that Christy weird hand signal thing. And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, look, I, I, I do see it slightly differently because they all went onto that stage having made a pledge that they would support the party's nominee. I, so Never they, did they say are, that they had to support a convicted felon in that pledge. The party's nominee, <laughs> there's no asterisk right. there that says he can't have a mugshot, right? So I, I feel for them in the sense that they, they were sort of like, none of them wanted to raise their hand except Vivek, yeah. right? None of them wanted to, yeah. but I think they all felt like they had to. Pat, how did Vivek end up the center of attention? It because, makes, I, I don't understand I don't that game to. theory because <laughs> leaving DeSantis alone seemed to be... You know, if you're everybody else uh, truly trying to actually get to Trump, you have to go through DeSantis. I'm a big Eagles age. fan, and their, their famous song, The New Kid in Town, yeah. it applies in politics, too. And he's the new kid in town, and he wants to get as much attention as possible. And he'll say and do anything to get that, that attention. And he fulfilled that objective. But he also had some previous new kids in town who now have some maturity, some political maturity, like Chris Christie, mm -hmm. uh, Pence, and also Nikki Haley. And they went, we're not going to put up with this. And that was, a, that was a tough debate decision because the more they jump on him, the more attention he gets. But they drew him out. I mean, he, he's almost from a foreign policy perspective. He's the uh, Neville Chamberlain. Mm. He's not Ronald Reagan. Well, but did they draw him he, out, or were he, they really trying to attack he, Donald he, Trump? He's asking for a revolution. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. Was this the other candidates? Because the, the, I've got the equivalent of punching your couch cushion. You can't attack Donald Trump, so they're going to attack Vivek. I don't know. That's an interesting theory. I actually hadn't thought about that. Uh, I, I, I don't think most of them wanted to attack him. I think he just got on their nerves. He was so freaking obnoxious. He was a little chihuahua biting at their ankles, and he finally <laughs> couldn't take it anymore. Who's this, who is this? I mean, can you imagine somebody who admitted he hadn't even thought about foreign policy until six months ago mansplaining to Nikki Haley, who was the U.N. ambassador, about foreign policy? I mean, they, they just couldn't help themselves. That's, that's what I mm. think. Stephanie, what did you say? You know, I think that he embodied exactly what uh, the Harvard University calls him the section guy. Josh Barrow wrote about this. Mm -hmm. He's the guy who speaks in class incessantly but doesn't say anything of merit or of substance. <laughs> and everybody can't stand him, but they kind of have to still be on his good side because one day he's going to be running for public office. And here he is running for president. Danny, what does it say that he's, this guy successfully hacked his way into the center stage of the party this easily? Just that the information ecosystem just sort of olayed him to center stage. I think that is exactly the right question to ask. And uh, look, I, I have a, a Vivek-style answer, a glib answer for you. Um, uh, look, everything has become like reality TV. This is how we ended up with yeah. the guy who kept saying, you're fired, and everybody was like, oh, my God. So he's oh a Kardashian. God. Exactly. He, he's, he, and and he there's no accountability in yeah. politics. 
right? He can say whatever he wants. That's and if right. he said something different the day before, no one cares because he's there and he believes He's entertaining it, you in the moment. And he's entertaining you exactly yeah. in the moment. He's, he All called right. everyone. But, you know, some, some voters did want to see some some toughness. Look what happened. At, you know, a lot of times candidates want to tell us, oh, nobody asks us about Trump on the trail. Here's Tim Scott on the trail being asked by a Republican about Donald Trump. Watch this. You're not standing toe-toe to -toe with somebody who you don't well, uh, accept as well, we a president. we actually disagree on the foundation, the premise of the question, the problem. Sure. And the premise of the question is, why don't you stand up to Trump? You're just wrong that I don't. That's the, that's the I premise. never heard you. That's, that's, I didn't hear you the other night stand up the, and say, I can't the, accept him as president. Do you want to have a conversation or do you want to have a monologue? So I'm happy to listen, but if you want to have a dialogue, I, I'll be speaking as well. Pat, that escalated quickly. I was stunned that... Tim Scott sort of almost went after the voter. The voter didn't seem like he was being angry. He knew he was being filmed, and he also knew he didn't want to irritate the Trump base. Wow. And that's, listen, I'm an example of that. I had a 30-point lead at one time in a U.S. Senate race, and the minute Trump went against me, I dropped. That's the power of Donald Trump. And you, the interview you did earlier with the new kid in town, he, he's talking about a revolution. While in the same interview, he also said he's going to change the tone. Yeah. I mean, that's within yeah. 48 hours. Stephanie, you, you, you represented the swing, one of the swingiest districts of the country. What are people hearing? Well, you know, one, I think that was like a, a mistake. I mean, you never engage with your voters that way on camera no. or not. I mean, that's just like a rookie mistake in, in engaging with voters. But in a, a swing district, you know, I think they are really wondering why we're faced with these two options. Like, and this debate was sort yeah. of separate from what the presumptive uh, nominations are going to be for both parties. Um, and, you know, we're a country of 300 million people, and we don't have better alternatives. I want to bring up one other thing about our Iowa poll that was stunning, because I think it tells us the way the Republican Party has changed. Let me show you what the makeup of the Iowa caucus, the Republican uh, caucus electorate was in 2016. It was... 50-50, slight advantage male, 52%, 48%. According to our poll that we released this week, mm -hmm. the likely uh, Republican electorate is now 61% male, 39% female. Um, this is the Trump effect. Whatever we want to talk about it, this appears to be the Trump effect, does it not, Danny? Well, that more men are turning out, but I think it's interesting that I, you don't have any breakdown there, so I don't know no, what the racial smaller. makeup. The, the, I don't know the, what the it's racial the same. makeup is. This is Iowa. It's all the same except for gender. Everything else is the same on ideology and college education. It is we are seeing more men identify as Republicans and more women not. Well, there is, that's something that the Republican Party needs to deal with because there are a lot of women in this country. <laughs> and we just had the summer of Barbie and Taylor Swift um, tour. I mean, women are having a moment in this country where they have an economic impact. They are having a voice, and they are, they're going to want to go to the polls and, and reflect that. Right. I thought, that's why I thought Nikki Haley did a good job Absolutely. in presenting that face. She potentially has room to grow if she can somehow get women to show up. So yeah. there's a lot of, you know, Very everybody's quickly. afraid of going after Trump, right? But if you look at primary polling, Trump's around 50, 52 yeah. percent. Half of the party isn't aboard. Now, if there's 10 right. people splitting the rest of the vote, that's a problem. But if you can consolidate. Well, you have uh, allowed me to uh, tease really well to our data download. When we come back, there is a divide <laughs> in the Republican Party among voters who believe President Biden was legitimately elected and those who still believe Donald Trump's lies. We're going to show you what we learned from that split inside the Republican electorate in Iowa. Data download is next. Welcome back. It's data download time. There are a lot of ways to try to understand the 2024 Republican primary electorate. But we got some new data that suggests one of the more crucial splits may be between those Republicans who believe Donald Trump won the 2020 election and those who don't believe and actually acknowledge that the former president lost. Let me show you here. It's almost a pretty even split. Barely a majority believe Donald Trump's false assertions. assertions. 41% of Iowa Republican caucus goers do not believe Donald Trump's claims. And you know what? It leads to some interesting splits. Your favorability of Donald Trump depends on whether you believe him. Those that believe him, 92% favorable rating. Those that don't believe him, just 30% have a favorable rating here. As you can see, DeSantis, Scott, and Ramaswamy all have more evenly divided favorable ratings among both groups. In theory, they might be able to unify the two groups. Donald Trump, 
not so much, shows you a potential way to build a coalition. Look at the divide between these two groups. Again, 51-41 here. Gun enthusiasts, much more likely to be a gun enthusiast if you're in the believe category, 43% not believe. Religious affiliation, more devoutly religious, those that believe Donald Trump's lies. You're more likely to be moderate if you don't believe Donald Trump's lies about the election. And as you can see here, the biggest divide among these those that believe and don't believe, your college education status. Nearly 60% have a bachelor's degree among those that do not believe Trump's false assertions. And it also leads to some interesting splits on some key issues. Use of military at the border, gender-affirming care ban for minors, as you can see here, significant divides. But among the most significant might be the idea of more aid for Ukraine. Just a quarter of those that believe Trump's lies support more aid for Ukraine. Over half who do not believe Trump's lies support more aid for Ukraine. So as you follow this primary season, keep track of those that believe the election, uh, election lies of Donald Trump and those that don't inside the Republican electorate. Monday will mark the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, where nearly a quarter million Americans gathered on the National Mall in the fight for civil rights. Some know the event best as the day Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech, where he brought attention to race relations, police brutality, and voting rights. Many of the same issues we're still dealing with today. Three days ahead of the march, Dr. King responded to some of his critics right here on Meet the Press. I'm sure that uh, many whites, both uh, North and South, have the feeling that we are pushing things too fast and that we should cool off a while, uh, slow up for a period. Uh, I cannot agree with this at all, for I think uh, there can be no gainsaying of the fact that the Negro has been extremely patient. We have waited for well now 345 years for our basic constitutional and God-given rights. And we still confront uh, the fact that we are at the bottom of the economic ladder. I think instead of slowing up, we must push at this point and we must continue to move on. And I'm convinced that our moving on will not only help the Negro cause, so to speak, but the cause of the whole of America, because the shape of the world today just doesn't permit our nation uh, the luxury of an anemic democracy. Those words may be 60 years old, but they have an impact today. When we come back, who has more to lose if a third-party candidate jumps into the presidential race? Panel's next. Welcome back. So let's look at a Biden uh, general election campaign and this idea of a third party. Pat, you are a big part of No Labels. You guys are mm -hmm. recruiting candidates. What is this ticket going to look like? And, uh, and is this a 100% commitment that there's going to be a, a ticket from no labels. Well, Nikki Haley in the debate confirmed that 65% of the people are disgusted with both Trump and Biden being our only choices. They're asking, isn't America better than this? Can't we have a better choice? And the momentum, the movement of no labels is uh, on fire right now. People are looking for another. I, I get that people candidate. don't want. And I know, I know. I wait a minute. No, there are a lot not. of people. There are a lot of people. No, they're not. There are a lot of people. I'm telling you right now. There are a lot of people who predicted Trump would never be president. Are the same people who are saying there's no way in hell a third party mm -hmm. can win. I'm telling you, we've never had 65 percent of the people disgusted. So no with label both parties. is literally a movement that says we stand for nothing. Imagine going that to Walmart so... or Target and oh. seeing no labels. You on haven't the read obviously products the 30 are issue statements of no, no labels. The issue statement ignores abortion and it has such what, barn, you, you missed the whole, barn burning issues such as you medical tort it. reform that'll light up the audience you have not read so it. the, the reality it. is it's 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 finance <laughs> industry heavy oh i read it no i actually did read it, read it. i read it last night so i <laughs> that's why i couldn't sleep <laughs> yeah, really. Well, Nikki so, Haley basically repeated the, the no label. No, 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 no. So, so right. the, the problem isn't isn't oh uh, they don't like you know um, Biden or Trump. Is that you are creating this idea that there's a mythical unicorn creature that will agree with these people who want something else yeah. that doesn't exist. When Magellan pulled uh, Mansion and Huntsman. Mm -hmm. Like it was like what twelve percent, fifteen percent, and that wouldn't even get that much. All right. I, I, don't, I don't, I don't know. I will say, and again, this is this is anecdotal conversations at my house. Is <laughs> that is that does that reflect the country? I don't know, but I will say that. None of us want to vote for Trump, and none of us want to vote for I Biden. I want to vote for Biden. No, no, I know who you want to vote for, dude. Yeah. That wasn't a question. 
But oh, average sorry, people, house. average people, my house, don't want to vote for Biden, right. don't want to vote for Trump. And I don't think it's crazy. We All do right. want to vote for somebody. Stephanie, you were, you're, you were <laughs> ideologically in the middle. I, I wanted some ideological diversity. We got a lot of it here. So where are you on this? Well, I, I think I agree that when I have conversations with uh, people in the swing part of what used to be a swing state, um, they say, you know, the both uh, presumptive nominees are running on a I'm better than the alternative campaign, right? What it, Biden said uh, in the last campaign, don't judge me against the almighty, judge me against the alternative. That's not going to be enough because people are saying to themselves, why are these our only alternatives? Biden has to give people a reason to vote for him, not just voting against Marcus, Trump are you if he comfortable, wants to win. Are you comfortable that they're that there isn't a Democratic primary? Would you like to see Biden have to no, no, no. come up there, with a better no case? Biden is actually very popular amongst the Democrats. In civics polling, civics with a Q, mm. Biden mm. is sitting around 80% with Democrats. There's no space. You think there's no space for an anti-Trump? There really is no uh, space for an anti-Biden. And there's a, I mean, just, yeah. you talk about, you know, popularity. You see, right now, you see Republicans going to groundbreaking ceremonies yeah. for Build Back Better and for uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I, I because have, taking credit for, for, for projects that they voted against. Right. I actually would say that um, <laughs> there's not competition because a lot of these people are younger. And the bench is younger, and they're preserving their ability to run in the future, and they don't want to go up against a sitting president. Pat, that's how we don't have Can you give options. us some names? Because, I, you know, Mansion and Huntsman ain't going to – that's not going to get you your unicorn. You, are there, what other I, candidates I'm just saying, I don't think there's going to be Will a shortage. Will Hurd one of your candidates? I don't think there will be a shortage of candidates. Why can't you guys name some names? Because we want to go through a good process. We're going to have a convention in April, and we're going to be very transparent with American people, as we were with the 30 issues, the common sense issues. So that who we funds presented. your movement? Are we going to talk about transparency? What's that? Who's the funding? The, the same people who right. have groups that are funded with MoveOn.org right. that are trying to stop us people. from getting on the ballot. This is a discussion that has to end because of time, but it will not end. Yeah. Other than that, all right, that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week. As if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.